Hello and welcome. In this video, we're going to talk about a very important concept related to model performance evaluation, and that's known as receiver operating characteristic or the ROC curve. So what is an ROC curve? An ROC curve is a graphical representation which is used to assess the performance of a binary classification model. It displays the trade-off between the model's ability to correctly identify the positive class or the true positive rate and its tendency to generate false alarms by incorrectly classifying the negative class as positive, which is captured through the false positive rate. Two important takeaways from the ROC curve are a model performance metric, which is known as the area under the curve, and most important is the right threshold. So a model generally predicts the probability. The probability is then converted to a class using this threshold. ROC curve helps us determine the right threshold for a given model. We'll discuss these two concepts at length as we progress. So here is the familiar confusion matrix. We have discussed this in a previous video where we've covered what these boxes are. And in fact, we'll also do a quick recap for the current video. So confusion matrix essentially is a two by two matrix, which helps us identify various model performance measures like accuracy, recall, and precision. And an ROC curve would also find its roots in this confusion matrix itself. So let's take a scenario. Let's say we are talking about a bank which has reached out to its existing customers pitching for a term deposit. And we have these zeros and ones, which are the historical responses from the customers. So this one, which suggests that we should target a prospect, represents a scenario where a person historically has accepted the offer. And for those cases where the people rejected the offer, the prospect rejected the offer, we are suggesting that we should not target. Please note, these are the occurrences that have already happened. So these are captured as historical occurrences. Zero means person rejected the offer. One means the person accepted the offer. Now, based on the model, we will try to come up with prediction. Now, prediction is not something that has already happened. Prediction is something which is yet to happen. So in your prediction, when you predict a one, it simply represents these are the people who are likely to accept the offer as per the model. And a zero here represents the case where these are the people who are likely to reject the offer. Why are we saying likely? Because this is yet to happen. And that's why the models don't generally predict the classes directly. They predict the probabilities. These probabilities then in turn are compared with a threshold, which is by default set to 0 0.5 in most of the models. Then the rule is that you compare your predicted probability with the threshold. If the predicted probability exceeds the threshold, then the prediction is 1. Otherwise, the prediction is 0. So all of this we don't necessarily see in the code when we apply it through scikit-learn, but this is what is internally happening. Now let's look at this case. These are the predicted probabilities. And let's say we compare each value here with 0.5. So these highlighted values, as you can see, are the values which are definitely greater than 0.5, which means the prediction as per this rule would be one for all these predicted probabilities. And what about the remaining cases? It is going to be zero. So from the probabilities, we have come to the classes. And now that we have the ground truth labels, and the predicted classes, we can populate a confusion matrix. Let's say we continue to work with a threshold of 0.5 right now, and let's try to find out how do we go about filling these boxes. Just to quickly recap the concept of true positive, true negatives, false positives, and false negatives, here are the definitions. The true positive would represent the number of actual ones which were classified correctly by the model. It was an actual one, and the model also says it's a one. True negatives, on the other hand, would be the actual zeros or the scenarios where we should have not targeted identified correctly by the model as well. So these two boxes are marked in green because they have complete synchronization between the actual versus predicted. However, there's a problem with these two boxes where we have false positives and false negatives. False positives essentially represent false alarms. So as per the model, the false positives should be targeted. But the reality that we know is that these are the people who rejected the offer. So what would happen? We will incur a cost. We are going to target these customers, but they're not going to subscribe. Similarly, false negative. So these are the people who actually would have subscribed, but the model suggested not to target these people. So this represents a loss. If we would have targeted these people, we would have got the conversions, but the model suggested otherwise, and we lost these people. So for a good model, we would want to minimize the false positives and false negatives. Let's quickly populate this confusion matrix for this data. So to begin with, let's identify all ones identified as ones. And these are our true positives. If we count, the number is four. 
Then let's identify all zeros that have been correctly identified. So these are three. We update that number here. Let's go to false positives. These will be the cases where an actual zero, a zero in this column would have been called a one. So there's just one instance that will be updated here. And finally, the false negatives. What are these cases? These are going to be ones which have been classified as zero by the model. So these are two cases and our confusion matrix is up to date. Now let's look at the true positive rate or recall and the false positive rate. So a true positive rate by definition is true positives divided by true positive plus false negative. And a false positive rate is false positive divided by the false positive plus true negative. The other names for these terms are recall and sensitivity, which is the same as TPR. And FPR or false positive rate is also known as one minus the specificity, which is nothing but true negative divided by true negative plus false positive. You'll find that term in some books. Now let's understand what is the meaning of TPR. We understand this is the formula to calculate TPR, but what is the meaning of TPR? So TPR essentially talks about what proportion of the actual ones were classified correctly. See, if you do the total of this row, false negative plus true positive, this is the number which are the actual subscribers, actual people who said yes or accepted the offer. And when we say true positives, this is the number where the model and the actual finding is in sync. So of the total actual ones, how many were identified correctly? This proportion is known as the true positive rate. Likewise, of the total negative class, which is zeros, we have true negative plus false positive. What proportion did we misclassify? This is the proportion of false alarm, we can say. So false positive divided by false positive plus true negative. In our case, if we plug the values that we populated, we get these values here. So the true positive rate is 0.67 or 67% and false positive rate is 25%. Now, this is happening when the threshold that we have considered is 0.5. What if we change the threshold to zero? So if we change the threshold to zero, then as per the rule that whenever a predicted probability is greater than the threshold, you have to predict one. Now notice all these values that you see here actually are greater than zero. The smallest value is 0.10 or 10%. Since all these values are greater than zero, the prediction is going to be one throughout. Now what will happen? In this scenario, we'll be able to identify all the actual ones properly because we are predicting only ones. So all the actual ones in the data or the ground truth will be identified correctly. But at the same time, we will misclassify all the zeros because we never predicted anything as zero. So we can't identify it properly. So all the zeros are misclassified. And if you look at the counts, the actual ones were six and false positives that we have here are four. Now let's discuss what will happen to the true negatives and false negatives. See, the point is this value occurs only when we identify a zero correctly. Since we never predicted any zero, we are not going to identify any zero correctly. And this value, false negative, occurs when a one is being called a zero, but we never said anything is a zero. So both these values are going to be zeros only. So now if we go about calculating the true positive rate and false positive rate, and we plug these values here as per the formula, we're going to get the true positive rate as one or 100% and false positive rate as 100%. Note, this is happening when the threshold has been taken as zero. Your true positive rate is 100%, which means all the actual ones were identified correctly, but all the actual zeros were misclassified. The error is also 100%. Let's take another extreme. What if we change the threshold to one? What will be the predicted class? Again, remember the rule. Would now there be any value greater than one? Because we are talking about probabilities and probability as a value always ranges between zero and one, never exceeds one, never goes below zero. So now since the threshold itself is one, a probability can never exceed one. So we are consistently going to predict zeros now. And if that is the case, what will happen? We'll identify all the zeros correctly. The two negatives, four out of four. At the same time, we will misclassify all the ones from the ground truth data. So all these cases of ones are misclassified because we are only predicting zeros everywhere. So now you can guess what will happen to the false positives and true positives. We never said anything is positive. False positives happen when a zero is called a one, but we never predicted anything as one in the first place. So false positives are going to be zero. And true positive happens when a one is identified as a one. That again is out of question because we are consistently predicting only zeros. So we will never call a one a one here as per this threshold. So these values are going to be zeros again. 
And if we calculate the true positive rate and false positive rate now by plugging these values from the confusion matrix, these turn out to be zero. So for a threshold of zero, we found the true positive rate and false positive rate to be ones. For a threshold of one, we found the true positive rate and false positive rate both to be zeros. So there is no correct identification of a one as a one. We completely failed here. At the same time, in the false positive rate, we made no error. Why? Because we predicted only zeros. So all these zeros were correctly identified. There is no question of a false positive rate error. This error is again zero. So to summarize, we started with a threshold of 0.5, which is what is the default threshold in most of the tools and libraries. We got some values of TPR and FPR. Then we tried with a threshold of zero. We got the TPR and FPR values as one. And then we tried a threshold of one. We got the TPR and FPR values of zero. So if you realize upon changing the threshold, the confusion matrix, these numbers somewhat get modified. And as a result, the TPR and FPR calculations also suggest different values. Is it possible that we try to calculate TPR and FPR over a range of thresholds? Well, that's exactly what the ROC curve does. So an ROC curve would have the x-axis as the false positive rate and the y-axis as the true positive rate. And these points marked here in red are representing various thresholds. Let me show this actual output to you now. So here is the actual ROC curve generated using some data. If I hover the pointer here, you can see that each value here, each red dot here represents a value in terms of x, y coordinates. For example, this value suggests that the threshold that we have taken is 0.9 and the value of FPR is zero, whereas the value of TPR is approximately 10.7%, x comma y. Look at this value. This value is taken as a, at a threshold of 0.5, where the false positive rate is zero, but the true positive rate or the recall is 57%. Likewise, if we go up, you can see now at the threshold of 0.4, the false positive rate, the error has gone to 20% approximately, and the true positive rate or the correct identification of true positives is at 73%. Similarly, if we go to another value, threshold is reducing. So this was 0.5, then we came to 0.4 and now 0.3. And what is the value? The false positive rate has further gone up to 40% and true positive rate has also gone up to 85%. So ROC curve essentially represents a trade-off between the true positive rate and the false positive rate. How much error are you willing to tolerate, as in the false positive rate, are you willing to tolerate for an improvement in the true positive rate? So coming back to the slides, let's understand what else does it represent. So you can imagine this x-axis is of length one, and this y-axis is also of length one, because these are false positive rates and true positive rates cannot exceed one. There will be values between zero and one. When the sides are one and one respectively, the overall area is going to be one. And if you consider this dashed green line here, this is called a random classifier. It actually represents a model for which the true positive rates and false positive rates would stay equal at all places. If you follow this grid, you can imagine this is a 0.6 here for false positive rate, and again, a 0.6 here for a true positive rate. So this essentially represents a line at a 45 degrees angle. Area of this triangle would be half of the overall area, which was one. So this is going to be 0.5. Now a model is going to be a good model if it covers an area above this triangle. And the more it is, the better it is. So in our case, if you see, this model covers a significant area above the lower triangle. And this area, which is shaded green area that you see, entire area, is called the area under the curve, which is a model performance measure. So we said we, we get two important takeaways from ROC curve. Number one is we get to know a model performance measure called area under the curve. The higher it is, the better it is, and it should be at least better than 0.5. Now, the second important question that's yet to be answered is, how do we find the right threshold? And in order to answer this, let's come back to Google Collaboratory, where we've written some small code. So I'll show you how to find the right threshold for a model. It becomes a very important decision in a lot of classification problems. So it's a must know. So we are importing the basic libraries here to begin with. Apart from NumPy and Pandas, we have called the train test split because we'll show you exactly the way this code should be applied. We are trying a simple model, which is logistic regression. From scikit-learn metrics, we have called ROC curve, and we are creating some dummy data from scikit-learn library using make classification class. So let me just execute this. And then we are generating some XY pairs using this make classification method, where we are generating 1,000 samples, which will have 10 columns. and the target column will have two classes. We've also kind of given the proportions. 
And this random state is given to ensure that whatever we do is repeatable and reproducible, which means it would give us the same output when we read on the code. We divide the data into two parts, train and test. And that's what we are doing here. Once again, mentioning a test size as 20%. So train would automatically be 80%. And then again, a random state. So it doesn't have to be 42. You can write any number. It's just a number that we've written here. This would lead to an outcome, which will be the X train, X test, Y train, and Y test. Now let's instantiate a logistic regression model and fit it on the training data. So we are calling the logistic regression model from the scikit-learn linear model, and we are fitting it on the training data. This is called learning. This is what machine learning in fact is. And now once the model is fit, we would want to generate predicted probabilities. Notice if we change this function to dot predict instead of dot predict underscore probe, it will straight away give us the classes but we don't want that here. We want to predict the probabilities and particularly the probabilities of ones. So if you print the output here, you will get to see that it predicts probabilities in two columns, the probabilities of zeros and probabilities of ones. We are only taking the probabilities of ones right now. That's why we are running it like this. And once that is done, these predicted probabilities and the actual labels will be given as an input to this function called ROC curve. I would suggest we should do it not for the test data, but for the train data. So I'm making a small change here. This should not be test, this should be train because this is how we are learning it. So we are predicting the probabilities on the training data and we are trying to generate the false positive rate, true positive rate and thresholds for the train data using the actual train labels and the predicted probabilities. Now, if we want to find out the optimal threshold as we have learned, we will take the difference between the true positive rate and false positive rate. See, true positive rate is something good. False positive rate is the error. So using this numpy.argmax, we are essentially trying to find out the index of that value of threshold, which has the maximum difference between the true positive rate and false positive rate. Essentially, which maximizes the difference between true positive rate and the false positive rate. And then to these thresholds, we will just pass this index and get to know the right threshold. So if you see the right threshold is 0 0.20. Imagine by default, this threshold that's given in case of most of the tools is 0.5. But as per our data, when we check the right threshold, it's 0.2. So this threshold is the right threshold to be used for training data now to convert the classes to ones. And same threshold would be passed on to the test data as well. What you learn from training is what you're supposed to pass to test. So this is the right threshold for the given model. Now, if you want to visualize this data using the ROC curve, we can visualize it using matplotlib or plotly. So I'm using plotly here in this particular case. We are, we are taking the X and Y values as FPR and TPR respectively. These are the values that we got from that function called ROC curve, this function. And then we are drawing lines. And also for the diagonal line, we are just mentioning that we want, would want to label it as random classifier and it will be a dashed line. And we are not displaying that separately in the legend. And this is just the layout. So we are giving some input related to the range of x-axis and y-axis and the dimensions, et cetera. So here is your ROC curve for the given data that we just looked at. You can see the area under the curve looks quite decent because it is way above this random classifier, which is this dashed line. So this much is 0.5 or half, and this is a lot more than that. So this looks like a decent model. That's pretty much about the ROC curve. We'll be needing it further when we solve classification problems. And you'll see more of hands-on there. Hope you get clarity on why ROC curve is needed and what's its relevance. Thank you.